Hi, my name is Amalia Pica. I am an artist. I am from Argentina and I'm based in London. Uh, my practice is generally concerned with what brings people together, um, communication, miscommunication, uh, and failures to, and attempts to talk to one another. I'm particularly interested in gesture and that is why I chose this painting. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Priyash Mistry. I'm the Associate Curator for Modern and Contemporary Projects here at the National Gallery. I've got that lucky job of working with artists who are living uh, to respond to the collection. Um, I'm thrilled that you've all come to join us this evening for our Unexpected View talk. This is a series where we invite a contemporary artist um, to come in, choose a painting in the collection and use it as a springboard to explore the shared themes, the ideas, some of the, uh, some of the uh, aesthetics of the work that might be shared with their own practices. Not only so we learn a little bit more about the painting, but also the different ways that artists work today. I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by the wonderful artist Amalia Pika this evening and to be hosting a, speci a very special performance that you might have seen just outside um, as you're walking in um, and to be standing in front of this beautiful work, this painting um, by, G um, um, by Giovanni Paolo Panini titled The Lottery in Piazza Montecitterio uh, from 1743. Um, and it's a really interesting work for us to be looking at today because um, I hope we can explore some of the ideas around not only this kind of moment of celebration of this kind of bringing together within the painting, but also a little bit about um, how Panini has thought about exploring this idea of a, of a public uh, square and a public setting um, and the action within it. So I've been a fan of Amelia's uh, playful and um, thoughtful work for many, many years. And um, her work is one that considers moments of joy, methods of communication within groups of people, and, but also within broader society. So I'm really delighted that we've chosen this work today to explore um, some of these themes together today. Um, Panini is, uh, as a painter, is best known for his cityscapes, portraying the most important and picturesque sites of Rome. So um, before I introduce Amalia more formally, um, I'd like to thank Hiscox um, as, uh, for supporting this event this evening as the National Gallery's contemporary art partner. Um, Amalia is an artist based in London, uh, born in Argentina, who uh, works across very different, uh, a broad range of different uh, media, including sculpture, performance, installations, video, and drawing. Um, she's held numerous exhibitions internationally. Um, I won't name them all, but just to name a few uh, of her recent projects, most recently at the uh, Center for Contemporary Art in Brighton, uh, the Museum House Constructive in Zurich, uh, New Art Gallery in Warsaw in the north of England, the Power Plant in Toronto, and NC Arte in Bogota. So really spanning the world there, <laughs> Amalia. Um, Using seem, uh, seemingly simple materials and found objects, her work investigates human modes of interactions, uh, systems of communication, and what brings people together. In our conversation, I hope we'll touch on Amalia's interest in the language of visual, visual codes that surround us, and the objects and signs of cultural celebration that she is drawn to. Uh, we may even touch on some other paintings in the collection that Amalia finds interesting, but to begin, Amalia, can I ask you, how did we come to choose this painting out of all of the paintings in the collection to, to hold our conversation in front of today? Um, first, also, I'm just going to say hello and thank you for having me. It's obviously an honor for me to be here, and thank you, everyone. Um, so we, uh, we sort of um, walked around, and uh, one of the things that I said was like, can we look at uh, paintings of crowds? Um, I'm often sort of interested in, um, in sort of the collective and the tension with, the, um, with how we also hold the collective in our minds when we are by ourselves. Um, and uh, so we saw, you, you brought me to see this one, and I sort of, love the absurdity of this big painting with sort of the, the main object of the painting is this very tiny 
white speckled, which is the lottery ticket. Um, so I just sort of really love that very tiny detail and how it becomes an excuse for this sort of um, uh, portrayal of um, civic monuments, but also Roman society. And, um, and it's that sort of tension in scale, but also that reference to paper uh, in a non-artistic way. So paper is a material that I use not only to draw on, let's say, so, but sometimes to draw it. <laughs> But it's, uh, I think it's really interesting in the way that you have picked up on this moment of detail. You know, Panini was really interesting in these moments of celebrations that happened within everyday life in Rome. Um, and he's really constructed the scene around this one tiny moment, but the moment is very far into the distance. So actually, for us, we know that the title is the lottery of, um, of, this, of this square in this famous piazza. Um, and this, it became quite a popular event around this time. So it was only really um, uh, consistently instituted perhaps a couple of years before this painting was, uh, was, was made. But he would have been commissioned by uh, a patron to produce a painting like this, to, to have in their home, to, to capture this kind of particular moment. But I think what really drew us is this, this moment is happening very far in the distance. There's a crowd gathering, but there's all these sort of vignettes of different kind of moments of different people across the painting. You know, um, you've recently spent time in Rome as well, Amalia. Yeah. And do you do you remember this building, the square? And yeah, and absolutely. The I think that was also I. I sort of was lucky enough to um, do a residency slash exhibition in Rome with the Fondazione Nemo. And uh, so it was just so fresh in my mind to have been there and um, uh, remembering this building, which then becomes the, the parliament of the lower houses. Um, uh, so then it is not um, that at this moment in time where it, when it's painted, but then it became that. It was a building that was commissioned um, always to be of public use. Or, and so it sort of has changed throughout um, so it's quite sort of an important um, political uh, backdrop, if you want, of the city. Should we talk about this one small piece of paper that's being dropped from the balcony? So on the balcony, we have um, a young child, a young child who's been drawn in, co-opted into taking out this piece of paper and throwing it into the crowd. But paper is something that has reoccurred, or small bits of paper, in fact, is something yeah. that's reoccurred in your work quite frequently. So first of all, I'm going to tell you this one thing that I didn't want to tell you before, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, but it is that my first job as a child, teenage boss, to draw the lottery on, te on television. No way! <laughs> <laughs> Which is not why I chose the painting, but <laughs> So basically, <laughs> it was for Loteria La Neuquina, and it was the special, the Christmas special, which is the biggest uh, prize. And I was in the thousands. So the way that it's structured, it's somebody says 40,000, and then the other child says 172. And then the last person is the one that, that says the location of that number in the lottery. So if it is number 20, it gets like said, like, ubicación 20. But if it is number one, it's like, ubicación uno. And it gets like, it's wow. a big draw. So that was my first job. Which I, I, I didn't want to tell you in advance. I want to talk more about this. Forget about the yeah. painting. Um, how old were you when you were doing this? I was like 13, 14. So wow. that very awkward sort of be between sort of a child and a teenager. That's incredible. You're the child in the painting. Yes, absolutely. How amazing is that? <laughs> Except mine you, yeah. was broadcast in local television, which I didn't think it was a big deal, but then it sort of, because it was the Christmas special, they interrupted the most popular yeah. TV show at the time, and then it was very embarrassing because I went out at, uh, Christmas Eve, and then everybody yeah. sort of was telling me that they saw me on TV. <laughs> it was the last time I saw it. I did it. But, uh. Did that connection also sort of, is that somewhere in your work in a sense? Because of that early exposure to perhaps television as a way of communicating or? I don't know? know, I don't know. As I said, I did not, I, this had, it was just yesterday that I remembered. I was like, it's so weird that we've chosen this paper. So let's go back to the use of the small paper. Let's go back to the small paper, paper. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's back ignore that fact though. Yeah. But I just, I couldn't not say it. Um, <laughs> It was the thousands. Anyways, um, so yeah, there's this um, 
small work, but that was uh, that I always show in a room by itself. Uh, it's from 2005, and it's called Nostalgia. And all you see is like a little um, strip of paper which has perforations, and it is what was left after the word nostalgia was typed into a telegraph machine. So it's basically Morse code for nostalgia. And it's just framed, and then there is a, a caption that I write, so not a machine so it's the, so it's the tape that comes out of the machine, of a telegraph machine. Exactly. So it's, in, it's sort of um, pierced with the code of Morse code. Yeah. So we have the, the odd job today to sort of let you see my work in your mm. minds, obviously, because we don't have, but that's what you see. You see a little piece of paper, and then you see a typed caption, yeah. which I, is something that I often play with. I sort of bring the caption into the foreground mm. or as part of the work. So it's, mm. it often sort of becomes um, a fight with the curatorial department to see where the caption for the caption goes. But the caption that is part of the work says, um, this is the word nostalgia, typed in telegraph code, um, and it was typed in the first machine that connected America with Europe. So when it was first um, thought to send a, a, tele a telegram across the ocean, um, there were several attempts to sort of draw a cable, and obviously by the time the signal had sort of traveled that distance, it had become too weak to be recognized. So later on that sort of, um, that was solved by the invention of the electric rep repetitors of signal. Um, but it was first solved by putting a halfway station in Iceland where every um, message was received and retyped and relayed onto. So what I did is I went to say this field tour to the museum of, uh, to East Iceland, Iceland Museum of Technology and asked for permission to use that machine to type the word nostalgia. So all you see is a very sort of small piece of paper, but um, it's meant to sort of give you the sense of scale of two masses of land and a small speckle um, in the middle of the ocean, which is Iceland, which actually became the connection between the two yeah. continents. And I always think about that work as in, um, there's, there's a sort of fragility implied by that work, not just the idea of this um, sort of small piece of paper within the large, you know, this large gallery space, and that's the thing that you encounter, this only, this small strip of paper. But also this idea of the fragility of communication, in a sense, you know, the fact that the message had to be retyped halfway through, because otherwise it would have been too faint to really understand or too, too lost to kind of, so this idea of trying to communicate or trying to cross a far distance. Yeah. But this kind of, um, this, this kind of vulnerability in that. Um, you've also used uh, paper in other kind of works as well. Um, we've got an interesting performance happening right now. You might not have seen it. Um, um, with lots of small bits of paper, but could you talk about where that performance originated? Yeah, so um, this is, let's say, the sister performance to a performance called the uh, Drip, where there's a person that has a small bag of confetti and they're throwing confetti into the air, but instead of like throwing an explosion of confetti, they're throwing one piece of confetti at a time and watching it fall. Um, which, um, it's called a drip because it was sort of, I was thinking about the way in which we might want to ration joy sometimes. Um, uh, but it sort of stems from a long interest of mine in, um, in things and the material culture, sorry the material culture of celebration and how it often overlaps with protest. Um, but it's because I, I think I'm interested in, in popular celebrations and carnival and moments in which you come together with other people in this sort of festive, joyful moment. Um, even if you're protesting, there's this sort of an euphoria that is sort of that comes from being together with other people in the public space, um, sharing um, a cause. Um, and, and it's sort of a metaphor of how we could live together better in that you might not know this person, but you mm. have this sort of cultural intimacy or invisible bond. So I've sort of taken to exploring confetti in different ways. Like there's another piece called Stabile, which is um, where sort of I type one by one, I, I 
tape, one by one confetti to the floor with scotch tape. So it's like trying to hold on to sort of this moment of celebration. Um, in this case, because of this, um, you will see later, but, the, but um, Iris is um, throwing, uh, drawing uh, raffle tickets. Um, and then it sort of went into something more to do with like fate and, and this sort of weird re relationship yeah. to the lottery. Yeah, an expectation. But it's interesting that you've adapted um, the drip after thinking about this painting in the lottery to something else uh, and hosting it in the gallery. It's really, it's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to focus on this idea of the moments of celebration because obviously in this painting by uh, Paolo Panini, we see um, really the focus of the celebration happening in the background where everyone's gathering to try and catch this um, tiny piece of paper, but it's kind of where the moment of celebration happens. Um, there's another work which I'd like to talk about um, where uh, you've also used a sort of ready-made object, as it were, um, something that signifies a celebration, bunting. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and but uh, using the bunting to enact um, a moment of connection between strangers. And in fact, that's the title of the work, Strangers. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very simple uh, performance that I often sort of think the same as um, this one that's um, now called the, the draw rather than the drip. But um, it functions a little bit more like a sculpture rather, but it is performed because it's made by um, people or actors. Um, it's, it's called Strangers and basically it's two people holding a string of bunting. Um, I'm not sure, yeah. And then their job is to not let it touch the floor. So they have to stand quite far from each other. A string of bunting is like around 10 meters. So there's that sort of distance in which you're sort of doing something with someone, but you couldn't have a conversation. And these two people have never met before, and that's their requirement for the recruitment, let's say, of the people. And they just have to stand there and sort of decorate the space. Um, but their job is quite dull, in fact. So it's this sort of also tension between celebration and sort of the banality of when it happens. Because there's not really a moment where they can really talk because they're almost kind of too far to be able to have a sort of conversation. Um, yet they're sort of brought together in this act of trying to hold up the bunting, you know, and allow this kind of sculpture to exist. There's something really beautiful in that, the idea of kind of bringing together people collectively in order to kind of enact something. Um, What's interesting about Panini's painting, if I can bring it back to, yes, to the, um, the lottery, is that you have um, uh, sort of such a myriad of different people within this kind of public space. When Paolo Panini was thinking about this work and there were numerous drawings that he had made in preparation, um, now held in different collections across the world, um, he actually planned a sort of quite a raucous group of um, uh, uh, crowds in, in in the square, but actually for the final work, you, he sort of dispensed with that and created these sort of vignettes of different moments of um, interactions from people of very different backgrounds, of different classes. Um, and there's something interesting about that idea of kind of fic fictitiously perhaps in, um, in Paolo Panini's case, but this idea of being able to bring people together in order to kind of collectively produce something. Um, there's another work, I think, which sort of does this, perhaps less in a sort of anonymous way, but, um, but also within a sort of civic space as well. Could you talk a little bit? I don't want to give too much away. I would love to hear you kind of talk about it more. Is it about assembly? Assembly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, this is a, uh, a performance that I, um, that I did. It's been repeated several times, but the first time that I did it uh, was in Buenos Aires and is where I invited uh, um, some people to take part and they had to bring a chair. Um, so everybody came with a different chair and then um, there was someone who was um, my lead performer who was more in the know of what we were going to do. And the instruction was very simple and it's to follow the first performer and do exactly what they're doing. And so what ends up happening in the performance is that um, they are walking in a line carrying a chair each. It's a group of around 40 people. 
um, and then the first person starts to sit in a circle and so they start to sit in a circle and then by the time the last person is about to sit down, the first person gets up and goes to form a circle somewhere else. And it's a sort of reflection about through sort of um, the form of politics, let's say, like this sort of this idea of the circle as a, as a shape of gathering, like from Stonehenge to the round table, um, how they're sort of trying to build this moment of assemblage, how they're trying to come into assembly, but um, how the process is often so difficult to self-organize and so, so it, it starts and it's, it sort of loops infinitely. But the first time that it was um, performed, I did it in front of the, in the, in the square of the, what is called the square of the two congresses, which is in front of the parliament building in Buenos Aires. And so I've often sort of returned to civic architecture as a backdrop to uh, my work when it's performative. Uh, which was one of the reasons why I was also very interested in this painting, because knowing that that was sort of a very important civic building in Rome and, and sort of understanding how he's used it pretty much as a backdrop. Um, and it's interesting to know, uh, to kind of draw that connection, because um, Paolo Panini was well known for making these kind of paintings of these kind of very uh, picturesque kind of scenes of Rome. But he also sort of constructed the space a little bit. So if you visit uh, the piazza, it's sort of, it's probably less crowded than this. He sort of invented even this little of a building on the side just to help the composition. And this column, um, the column of Marcus Aurelius, is actually a bit further away. So he sort of brought it into the composition as well. So it's also a slightly constructed space, but yet one which is about, I think, the power and prestige of, of, of Rome, of that location in Rome. Um, this also, this idea of kind of using a civic building or, or a civic space as a backdrop is something that you've used throughout your career, right? So mm. there was, you, talked, uh, you told me about in very early work that you made. Yeah, so I, I often think of this work that um, I'm going to describe now as my first artwork, even though obviously I had finished art mm. school, so I had tried to make other artworks, but this was the first time that I was like, oh, um, a bit proud of what I had done. <laughs> um, and it's basically, it was, I guess you could call it maybe a public space intervention, but basically um, it was uh, a sort of a light bath or um, to a public building, which was in the house where independence was uh, first uh, declared from the Spanish colony in Tucumán, so in Argentina in 1816. Um, the way that the process of independence in, in the South Cone of Latin America worked was that there was a project to liberate the entire South Cone. So after this, they fought a war, they went, um, uh, they headed to Chile and they had to cross the Andes, so they decided that they needed to formally declare independence before crossing the big uh, chain of mountains. And so this wasn't done in Buenos Aires, which is the capital of Argentina. Argentina is a very large country, geographically speaking, um, and so it was done in a city which was important, but it's quite sort of remote, um, called Tucumán in the... In the um, north of Argentina. And so it was declared in a, in a private home with 40 people. They just signed independence. And then at some point, it became a national monument. By the time it became a national monument, it was, it was very ran down. And so it was torn down, and then it was rebuilt again. And it went through different periods of history in which they just kept the room, or they rebuilt a different facade, mm. and then they tried to excavate the original facade. But year after year, um, these... Um, this house, uh, and it's also known as the Little Yellow House, sort of comes back as backdrops for um, school plays. Um, and I was, I studied, uh, I'm a national professor of sculpture, uh, but I studied, uh, basically I was an art teacher in private school um, in, in sort of my early years um, as an artist as well. And so I was sort of trying to make work that was sort of important to me, and at the same time every year I was like re redrawing this little house. And one of the things that I found incredible was at some point I just got tired of like looking at icon. I just went to look at the original, at a picture of the monument, and I realized that the house is actually white. 
So what the, what the work is, is me, it's called class period, and I was wearing a pinafore, which is the uniform for both students and teachers uh, in um, state school in Argentina. And I just rang a bell and I lit up the facade yellow. So I sort of turned it into this little house of the school book. And then after 40 minutes, which is a class period, it's sort of, I rang the bell and it, I turned it down. But um, I guess it was very much using, um, using the public building as a, yeah. as a backdrop. So I would just want to touch on, you know, this idea of using the public space as the sort of starting point for, or the sort of first iteration of many of these performances. But also, you know, bring it back to, uh, um, uh, to Assemblé. That work was then reenacted within um, a museum space, within an art gallery space. Yeah. Um, and it was, is it now in the collection of the Guggenheim? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what that transition means? Yeah, sure. And, so and there's, um, the, this work was then acquired by the Guggenheim, which is kind of an interesting moment uh, yeah. where museums are trying to see how to collect performance and how, um, obviously for me, it's great, it's a great collection. It also sort of means trying to work out what it means for that to exist beyond me. And, um, but so we sort of performed it again at the Guggenheim and, it, and inside the museum became a completely different thing because um, one might think of sort of the white cube as a sort of a vacuum, but obviously the Guggenheim has this sort of spirally architecture. So it became extremely choreographic and theatrical and it was sort of not having that sort of civic building as a backdrop really changed the performance in, in a way that I think I thought might happen, but I wasn't sort of anticipating to see how much. But it, one of the interesting things about sort of that process of a work like that um, becoming part of an institution is also how it sort of came from, okay, I've been invited to this performance festival in Buenos Aires. There isn't a lot of budget. Um, let's just get some people together and do something. And then suddenly it becomes, it enters a collection and then you, because the sort of the process to learn a painting can take several years, they just don't have a different way of learning. So you have to let them know with two years in advance that you're gonna ask people to bring a chair. And it sort of becomes this sort of paradoxical uh, thing about a very simple work, like she's there sort of yeah. throwing raffle tickets up in the air. And then if it becomes part of a collection, then it, it's treated in an entirely different yeah. way. Yeah, but I sort of wanted to bring it back to the performance in a way you sort of led, led us there. Um, because you've adapted the performance the, from the drip to now this idea, the performance called The Draw. Um, could you, what's interesting about it is that we're hosting it within the National Gallery, but you're using raffle tickets. And it's almost like you're taking the action from the painting, but taking it again into sort of this art gallery, the museum, the institutional space. Um, there's something really interesting about that. You know, I think there's something interesting about the idea of the lottery as a concept you know, within society. You know, this idea of the lottery as um, full of expectation, you know, this idea of hope and expectation of being able to do a big win and then perhaps um, climb the social ladder. There's something really interesting about that as a, an a, uh, as a sort of aspiration. Yeah. Um, but also as a sort of a form, I don't, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. As a form of almost social control, which mm. is also what Carnival or these celebrations that I've been interested in also yeah. had that sort of valve or valve sort of mm. uh, function, mm. um, which, can we talk about the rhinoceros? <laughs> yeah, we can absolutely talk about that. <laughs> yeah, those. one of the paintings that I really wanted to talk about as well when we were deciding was a, a sort of a small painting of yeah. the rhinoceros. By Piero Longhi, yeah. so uh, another Italian artist but working in Venice, who was very well known for painting sort of small scenes of um, daily life within Venice, but particularly around the Carnival. And we have this beautiful, tiny little painting of um, a rhinoceros which was quite a spectacle in that day. You know, rhinoceroses were very rarely seen in Europe um, during that time. And it's a specific rhinoceros called Miss Clara who toured Europe and was um, hosted within this uh, carnival. So she became very iconic. 
Yeah, I know at some point uh, I also became really interested in sort of animals being used as diplomatic gifts and I did um, some work around great apes and their ability to sort of acquire language and things like that. So that would have been a different talk. But it also does relate to, to this idea of carnival. And I think um, one of the things in which, like thinking about um, why am I uh, also called an artist if I work in such a different way and I don't do painting mm. and, um, uh, and what it means to work in, in this way. And it is that often we'll sort of look back and it's that now that performance isn't necessarily about this work, but it, obviously now it's somebody's like throwing raffle tickets up in the air in relationship to this painting. And then that might exist somewhere else and that might be taken somewhere else. And, what it's like as an artist to sort of allow yourself to sort of be inspired or be um, uh, almost also invited to do things and, and change your ideas around these things that happen to you, the things that you see and where your work is taking you as well. It's not this thing that we work in, mm. in sort of a vacuum. And so I, I sort of imagine, imagining what that performance will be like when there isn't this painting as a backdrop to it. Um, and that maybe it sort of becomes more about fate or the absurd mm. or... Um... Because I feel like those sort of themes are really inherent in the work. Um, one thing that I think is really beautiful about this idea of changing the confetti, you know, so this idea of the celebration to a raffle is almost as when Iris, who's performing the work, throws the, work, throws the raffle ticket in the air, there's almost this kind of this sort of ingrained hope in this idea of throwing it out there but then as you sort of as it falls quite beautifully as it falls to the floor suddenly you're surrounded by perhaps slightly absurdly all of these raffer tickets that haven't really flown anywhere and there's something really quite beautiful about that um, perhaps also Sisyphean in the way that you know she's sort of throwing all of the raffle tickets out one by one um, which reminds me that one of the things that I did want to do as an Argentinian artist was not to finish uh, a talk about the, a painting that is called The Lottery without uh, quoting Borges, who famously has uh, written an amazing short story about the lottery. So I'm just going to read a quote from my phone. Sorry to bring it out. Um, so it's um, The Lottery of Babylon, where he's imagining that uh, the lottery is not just uh, a way in which, the, in which you might get lucky, but also extremely unlucky, and how in Babylon it sort of became an institution that ruled people's destinies for the good, but also for the terrible. Um, I just wanted to read this little bit that says, once for an entire lunar year, I was declared invisible. I would cry out and none would heed my call. My call. I would steal bread and not be beheaded. I have known that thing that Greeks knew not as uncertainty. I don't know, there's something about sort of um, a bit of a funny thing about being Argentinian and quoting uh, such a writer, but it is um, also, it was so um, educational that I cannot not think about the lottery and think about this sort of yeah. sense of fate and the absurd, but also that thing that you are not in control of. Yeah, wonderful. So I think on that note, Please join me in thanking Amalia for uh, joining us this evening and showing her work. <laughs>